To look at the creation of this film, we have to hop around a little bit, chronologically. The last kaiju film I covered was Rodan, which came out after Godzilla Raids again. It was a film emerging from the political moment, made the monsters somewhat more sympathetic while dialing down scientific explanations, and showed that kaiju can sometimes have a Lovecraftian effect when the filmmaker wants it. After that was the enormous step backwards of Varen the Unbelievable, a black and white film originally made to appear on television in America, and one that the creators didn't feel inclined to give 100% on, as it was forced upon them. But the next monster film went in a bold new direction, introducing us to what is probably the most popular Toho kaiju besides Godzilla himself, Mothra. We wanted it to be brighter, nicer, Honda said, comparing their aspirations to a Disney picture. So Tanaka went to novelist Nakamura, who was a huge name in radio plays at the time, to create the origin story for a new monster for them. Working with two other authors, Nakamura wrote The Glowing Fairies and Mothra about a place called Infant Island with fairies and the great Mothra, but despoiled by atomic testing by a capitalist superpower, Rolasika. Originally, Rosharika, but was a little too on the nose, as that was a fusion of Russia and America's names. Rolasika has the military of the Soviet Union, with corrupt crony capitalism showing America at its most obsessed with money. The story would be the loose basis for the film adaptation, largely thanks to Sekizawa. The kaiju film that came after Mothra was one that I previously discussed, King Kong vs. Godzilla. If you haven't seen that video or haven't seen it recently, Sekizawa was some poor bastard drafted during World War II to go live on some stinking, hot, bug-infested, ass-end-of-the-world island in a futile attempt to win a war he felt they had no business starting. Sekizawa came back a changed man, but not the way you might think. Not, I've seen the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, but rather, I survived, and I am going to savor every moment of life that I now have. He ate rich foods, filled his house with model railroads, dressed in kimonos just because he liked them, and generally sought to wring as much joy out of life as he could, and wrote hit after hit scripts, to the point that Toho indulged in him writing animated films for Toei because his work was too good to lose by firing him. He was unashamed in his love for light-hearted fun, action pieces, and even science fiction. In an interview, he mentions the French film Pepe Le Mocha, John Ford's Rio Grande, and Kurosawa's Yojimbo, all in the same breath. When he went over Mothra, he cherry-picked and tweaked to his heart's content. Inseparable from the Mothra brand was a stroke of good fortune thanks to Toho's American film partner, Columbia. Sekizawa had reduced the number of Mothra's fairy priestesses from four girls to a pair of twins, since identical twins are much more rare in Japan than in many other nations, and so culturally are a bit more mystical. Well, Columbia was showing off a talented twin singing act from Japan called The Peanuts, who even appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show. They were tailor-made for this role. In fact, as film historian Dave Callett notes with amusement, they would spend 30% of their film career singing praises to a giant bug. Tsuburaya used a combination of blue screen and enlarged sets to give the actresses the appearance of being quite small. Their song of Mothra was actually a pop hit, and the music had a very western film feel to it, thanks to Ifi Kube sitting this one out, feeling that what they wanted wasn't really playing to his style. So Yuji Koseki, a former house composer for Columbia, Japan, gave the film its unique musical atmosphere. Mothra was a massive hit for Toho, and showed that the monster formula didn't have to be a formula. The plot of the film involves a Japanese journalist named Bulldog investigating the story of Infant Island's bombing and the villainous Rolisican businessman who's named Clark Nelson, who on his visit discovers the fairies and enslaves them to serve as entertainment. Mothra, through her life cycle, causes lots of problems, yet Nelson would still refuse to free them. 
and rule of Sicca would not force him because of his wealth and power. It's only when the capital of the country itself is attacked, New Kirk City, a kind of blend of L.A., San Francisco, and New York, only when that is attacked directly by Mothra do they finally turn against Clark, who dies in a confrontation with police. A scoundrel to the end, his last crime is stealing an old man's cane. What was notable about his greed was that when they arrived on Infant Island, Clark saw the fantastic plant that the locals used to survive the blast, and disregarded its potential market to treat disease, instead kidnapping the fairies, an indictment of American-style capitalism that was seen as morally bankrupt compared to Japan's more socially conscious form. To show that Clark was literally choosing style over substance here, it's all the more contrasted against Bulldog, so named because of how he didn't let go of a story, to refuse to continue with it when it would harm Mothra, the priestesses, and the people of Infant Island. Instead of the monster triumphing or being destroyed, she is given back what was wrongfully taken and then departs in peace. So the only actual monster was the greedy human being. With that, the door was now open to move from the monsters being the menace to the protagonist. However, the next step was the return of Godzilla, literally on ice since being buried at the end of Godzilla Raids Again, to battle King Kong. Even in a year when Toho is putting out some big pictures for their anniversary, King Kong vs. Godzilla was a financial smash hit. But still, it wouldn't be for another two years before they would produce another kaiju film, despite finally seeming to come up with the winning formula, Monster vs. Monster, which had made the film a hit in spite of less than impressive King Kong costumes. Sekizawa had delivered another hit script with a great salaryman subplot and embraced the wrestling-like situation the film presented. The film ends with a victorious Kong heading for home while Godzilla is underwater somewhere, his fate unknown. After King Kong vs. Godzilla, Honda was just creatively drained. It wasn't that he hated making monster movies, but he was just tired of not being able to make the kinds of movies that he wanted to make. At that point, his movies were being seen by more people than any other Japanese filmmaker, but there was only one name on the lips of international critics, Akira Kurosawa. There was art like Rashomon, and then there was Drek like King Kong vs. Godzilla. The irony of this was that Kurosawa so respected Honda's work that as part of his plan for a three-picture samurai film deal, he wanted the works all directed by others. Revenge by Horikawa, The Hidden Fortress by Suzuki, and Honda to direct Throne of Blood. Toho scuttled that plan when they saw how expensive Throne of Blood was, requiring Kurosawa himself to direct all three films. But part of his effort to break out of the control of the studio system was nevertheless working. Still, when one of his actors on Seven Samurai said he'd like to appear in one of those sci-fi pictures that the critics sneered at, Kurosawa said that if Honda was making it, it must be good. But the difference between them was that Honda was very subversive when he worked on his art. He worked within the confines of the odd places he found himself, whereas Kurosawa was always seeking a way to escape from it entirely. The reason the kaiju films are so much more than scares and spectacle was that Honda was an artiste who believed that, rather than saying, I'm too good for this material, he would instead raise the material up to his level as much as he could. Hunda was taking time off after that film to work on proposals for films on things that interested him, like a look at the development of flight in Japan, but the studio pulled the plug before production without explanation. He was like the cliché eccentric scientist who thinks of how to harness atomic power but has to be reminded that his shirt is on backwards. His wife would just put money in his wallet for whenever he left the house because he never thought about needing to pay for anything until the moment arose. And his daughter was always running after him to collect the change because he handed over money like an alien who was unaccustomed to the value of currency. It was during this time that a connection came up that just astonished me. This is going to be a moment where you're either completely get or you won't see the big deal. But the man who showed the world that a kaiju film 
can be a true work of art in all of its aspects, then worked on the Japanese dub of a film with the name of Sampo. Also known to fans of Mystery Science Theater 3000 as The Day the Earth Froze. He did the directing for the voice acting of the dub of that movie, and also wrote an essay on its special effects. If you're scratching your head wondering why I'm making a big deal out of that, just imagine for a moment if you finally opened your late grandmother's locked antique oak chest, only to find a Mork and Mindy lunchbox inside of it. It's not that it's wrong that it's there, it's just a juxtaposition that you would never really have imagined. Kurosawa had been trying to help Honda get his independence, but he just wasn't interested. Kurosawa was making more money and having better control over his films because of the newly created Kurosawa Productions, and told Honda, just let me talk to my lawyers and they'll set everything up for you. Your films are huge overseas. You deserve way more respect and money than you're getting. But Honda just wasn't interested in any of that. He wanted to make his own pictures, that's all not climb any kind of ladder or put his name on a letterhead. Subaraya, on the other hand, used this period to set up his own family-owned and operated Subaraya Productions, while still running special effects at Toho. He also wanted Hunda to come work for him, but there was way too much management involved in that job. Hunda just wanted to be left alone to make the movies that he wanted his way. He was trapped in a paradox. The only way to be able to do his films his way was to rise to such a level that he wouldn't have the time left to make movies anymore. Given the choice between making movies inside of the box they can find him to, or spending time not making movies trying to climb out of it, he chose making movies. One film he conceived of was Naked Spring, inspired by an actual event during the war, where Chinese and Japanese forces were both dependent upon the same spring in order to be able to survive. It was life or death whether or not you could get water from this spring. Rather than treating it as an asset to be acquired and held from the other side, the two agreed to permit the other side to take water whenever they wanted, and that during the time both sides were fetching water, they would be safe. This then develops further, where musicians are playing for one side, and then afterwards it suggested Hey, why don't you go play for the other side, too? And so on. Honda wanted to tell this tale, in the midst of war, of real human beings allowing their true natures to show through instead of the barbarity that was being ordered from those on high and far away. He wanted it to be about showing the brotherhood of mankind. Yet with rejection after rejection, it's no surprise that when he returned to make his next film, Mantango, he fully embraced the darkness of the story, so much so that the film was nearly banned in Japan. His next film after that was a sci-fi adaptation that also drew upon the war, Atragon, with this guy who refused to accept, even after all this time, that it was over for Imperial Japan. He was now going to use his new submarine to establish it once again. Sekizawa, no fan of Imperial Japan, naturally wrote the script in collaboration with Honda, a rebuke against returning Japanese nationalism of their time. Honda spoke of his main character, There were some Japanese people who, however the world turns, even when confronted with their wrongdoing, they still cannot shake loose their pride. I can understand this character very well, because I was also in the war. But instead of thinking, what about Japan? What I got from my war experiences was, what about humanity? Thus, when it came time to do the next kaiju film, Honda really wanted a chance to explore this brotherhood of humanity. The fact that when we neglect the problems of others, it's neglecting our own problems in the end. This was a film showing less what goes around comes around, and more you're only undermining yourselves because we're all in this together. The film was to be another kaiju versus kaiju using existing monsters. And obviously by now we have reached Mothra versus Godzilla. Mothra has been in many ways the hero, while Godzilla has always been the villain, so it's pretty obvious who is the face and who is the heel in this matchup. Indeed, the film is a very effective stitching of their two original films, 
Mothra's spiritualism and harmony, and Godzilla's dark reign of terror. When Sekizawa wrote this as originally a straightforward sequel to Mothra, complete with Roliskins making trouble and leading to a Godzilla attack on them, Honda explained what he was going for with this new theme. This isn't supposed to be about us and them. It's about us watching out, in the end, for us, because that's the right thing to do. Jun Tuzaki, who played the nationalistic subcommander in Atragon, returned to play the newspaper editor in a double act with Yu Fujiki from King Kong vs. Godzilla, as well as Sohara of Rodan playing, surprisingly, the greedy villain of the film. Hiroshi Kojumi, the hero of Godzilla Raids Again, is back as a heroic scientist trying to study the giant egg that is washed ashore and is central to the plot. The familiar faces in front of the camera reflected the steady hands behind it that had been through most of these since it all started with Gojira, and it's generally considered that this moment would be their apex, with them all at the top of their game to create the best film of this era. Ifu Kyube, back for this one, found how to fuse the feel of Mothra with the menace of Godzilla, though this led to a one bit of friction between him and Honda, as Honda, without his permission, reused part of the track for a scene that Ifukube felt called for silence from the music. But this was soon forgiven, as Ifukube appreciated that Honda knew and understood music much better than he pretended to, so that he normally allowed the man to do his business while being able to comment intelligently on the result. Sekizawa's script confines overt comedy to the comic relief character, while not allowing the story to be brooding in any way. Subaraya's monster costumes delivered as they always did, and the new optical printer that had been acquired for Matango allowed for much more seamless integration of the fairies into scenes. And as for Hunda, who had said that monsters are not innately evil, Mothra has made the embodiment of his theme. After all that has been done to Infant Island and its people, all the ways they were exploited and harmed, all the ways their suffering was disregarded, our heroes must now arrive, cap in hand, and ask for help against Godzilla. And it is the so-called monster that rises above the human impulse to allow suffering to happen to those who have inflicted suffering. Instead, standing up for them against this threat, no matter the danger to herself. Mothra becomes the avatar of Honda's message of universal love over all else.